What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. For full disclosure, the COE is on the road and already having some uh, technical issues without her at my side, but she will be back shortly. Um, Buster Murdoch, he is the only member of the immediate Murdoch uh, family dynasty, not dead or incarcerated. Uh, he spoke to Fox Nation. It's been all over the news, uh, saying that his father's murder was essentially unfair. He also believes that uh, his father, Alec Murdoch, is innocent of any family bloodshed. And we're going to discuss all that and much more right now with our best guests. And boy, are they good best guests. Eric Bland, the handsome fellow with the uh, new looking mic stand, the new setup there in his beautiful home in South Carolina. He was selected for inclusion in the South Carolina Super Lawyers in 2015, 2016, and 2017 list for excellence and recognition uh, in professional liability, one of two in the entire state with this honor. He also happened to uh, represent Gloria Satterfield's family. I think he still is uh, the Murdoch's housekeeper who died after a fall down a flight of stairs and is host of Cup of Justice, a true crime podcast. Collier Landry, the man with the best hair in the biz, with the blue, bluest of blue eyes. He is the living embodiment of human resilience, hope, and personal triumph over adversity. Uh, he has inspired global audiences around the world. Uh, he is a survivor and host of Moving Past Murder. He's also co-hosting Survivor Squad with Tara Newell, uh, where he discusses his own traumatic childhood story of the premeditated murder of his mother, Noreen, at the hands of his very own father, Dr. John Boyle Jr. Collier is also the creator of A Murder in Mansfield, a documentary from two-time Oscar-winning director Barbara Koppel, A Murder in Mansfield. Check it out. And we've got Sarah Ford hopefully making her way uh, into there. She is right on cue, I say it, and there she is. Uh, she has served as legal director at the South Carolina Victim Assistance Network since 2017. She leads a team of attorneys and advocates to provide direct legal services to South Carolina crime victims. Uh, she was hosting Palmetto Prime Time. Still are? Oh, there you go. Palmetto Prime Time. There you go. And last but not least, not hosting a podcast, Dr. Roger Rhodes. If you can flip your phone to the side, it would be awesome if that is your phone. Uh, if not, I'll take it. There you go. There you go. I want to see that more handsome side of you, Roger Rhodes, that big face. Uh, he is a <laughs> licensed licensed therapist in South Carolina. Special. Now you just went black, Roger, so might have to go oh, back boy. the other way. Uh, he is a licensed uh, therapist specializing in dysfunctional families. He's also worked inside the prison system, and there goes Rod. Not the best with technology. He'll be back in a moment. So, uh, so much to cover, and uh, we've got Eric Bland for about 50 minutes. He is being more than gracious. Uh, let's start off with the latest news here, uh, Eric Bland, and we'll go around the horn here, and that is tomorrow at uh, about 2.30 Eastern time, we're going to be covering a live press conference on Surviving the Survivor right here, and it's with uh, Jim Griffin and Dick Harpootlian they're going to be requesting a new trial. Uh, what do you make of this, Eric Bland? It doesn't surprise me. Um, it, it's probably going to be something to have to do with the discharged juror uh, or one of the jurors that were discharged. I'd be real surprised whether it's a uh, one of the jurors who casted a vote who now has changed his or her mind or revealed something that happened in the jury room that was problematic. It, it probably was one of the original jurors. The real question is going to be, in our state, when you appeal a case and it goes to the appellate court, the lower court is usually divested of jurisdiction. So it becomes an issue for the appellate court, and they've already filed their notice of appeal. And the issue is going to be, does this go before the appellate court or back before Judge Newman? Um, I, I think it was, uh, this has been in the works for a while. Um, it kind of dovetails with what Buster said in his interview, uh, with Martha McCallum, where he said that he believed that the jury, you know, came in with a preconceived decision and, and already had made a judgment on Alex, which would be against, uh, the judge's instructions that they're not allowed to make up their mind or begin deliberations or, 
do any type of research. Everything has to be sterile until the judge releases them to the jury room to deliberate. So I think it, um, it's going to be a big issue. Uh, the question is whether it's an issue that Judge Newman will hear or the appellate court. And if it's a discharged juror, um, I'm not sure you're going to place so much emphasis on that juror because that juror uh, had engaged in misconduct, uh, which caused, and I don't know whether it's a female or a male, for that juror to be discharged. But, you know, none of this really surprises me. Um, I think this whole setup with releasing the Fox News documentary was intentional. And, um, you know, Buster couldn't take any other position other than to say that his father was innocent, because if he comes out and says, you know, my father's guilty, um, he murdered my mother and brother, that wouldn't bode well with a case that's on appeal. So he's got to take the position that he believes in the innocence of his father. And uh, also, I think for him to be able to live with himself going forward, he has to have you know, a feeling that there is some kind of reasonable doubt on his father's guilt, because if he has to admit that his father was a murderer, then he himself has to look at him in the mirror and, and make a decision whether he has any of those characteristics. You know, for me, when he says his father was a psychopath with psychopathic characteristics, that he was a liar, a manipulator, and a cheat, those are huge things that he didn't know about his father prior to these murders. And, um, you know, Martha didn't ask a couple of follow-up questions. And as the show goes on, we'll talk about it. But one of the questions she should have asked is, you know, when she said, do you have any of these characteristics? And he said, no. And she should have said, well, what happened at law school when you were, uh, you know, discharged from law school, there was a play allegations are there was a plagiarism incident. So he possibly could have some, you know, cheating characteristics. I don't know if it's true or not, but there was a number of follow-up That seems really unfair to me, though, Eric. Sorry to jump in, but that seems really unfair. I mean, he's a victim, and, you know, I, I get it. Like, you know, he was a kid. He got kicked out of the University of South Carolina Law School. Totally understand that. But he's there just telling his story. I mean, for Martha, if she would have done that, Oh my God. I mean, that would have been crazy. Sorry. Not my show, not my podcast. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I jump in? Because I probably uh, feel like I'm probably the most, I have the most, you know, I, I'm, I can speak on this the most because my father murdered my mother. Right. And to sort of, to say that the apple doesn't, this is, this is the problem with, with our society is to even insinuate that just because this young man, you know, is it, it, it cheats on an exam or plagiarism or whatever. I mean, come on. Really? He's 27 years old. The technology has changed so much. Like everybody's plagiarizing everything. Let's keep it real. But yeah. the fact that this, but the fact that, that you could say that his father, who is a, who's a psychopath and a murderer and all these things that he's admitting that have these characteristics, like, look, right now he is going through the very, in my opinion, because I went through this, even though I heard my father murder my mother even though I testified against him and he went to prison for that, he's still incarcerated to this day. But the fact is that I, for decades, lived under the stigma of the whispers of, you know, apple doesn't fall far through the tree. Oh, God, <laughs> no, Here I'm, comes I the didn't boy say he's a murderer. And I this, wasn't saying that at all. I was but, saying that you have to look at the characteristics of the father that you didn't know existed. And how could you say that he is totally innocent? When you didn't even know of those characteristics that he had out his whole life, the father. He's, That's what I was saying. But he he did not kill these. He did not kill his mother. He did not kill his brother. And he has not been charged with any crime. So he is of innocent. Course. He is an innocent. Oh, he's totally and he has innocent. nothing. He has no, you you know he has nothing to do with any of this. So we just we just sort of need to like I guess bifurcate how we use our language here when we're saying he's he has the, these tendencies and to do insinuate you know, that somebody can have that because people will take that and run with that. And it's not fair to do as someone who's had to live this down his entire life. I mean, we're talking 30 years I've been living with this. Yeah. And, and, and listen, this is obviously very sensitive. And we brought Collier on because he has firsthand experience, a um, lot, lot of uh, emotion, no matter which way you cut it, uh, involved in this case. Uh, Dr. Roger Rhodes, since everyone else got a word in, and I want to get back to uh, the issue with this uh, motion for a new trial. And then we'll get into a lot of the uh you know, the interview, but Roger Rhodes, anything to, uh, to, to comment, uh, piggybacking yeah. there, what, uh, Collier said. And I want to jump in. Let's not act like 
the child that's left is in a vacuum in South Carolina. You know, there's a, a spider web of family that he's still connected to. He's still connected to his dad. So there's a lot of underneath connection that, that plays in to anything that's going on. You know, that, that he has a vested interest in, in playing whatever game that they, they lay out for him. And that's what he's going to do. And he's smart for doing it because it, no matter which way it goes, he's still going to have to be part of the Murdoch family in South Carolina. And Eric, that was a question I was going to ask you. Um, and, and, you know, Eric is a bit of a lightning rod in all this. You know, people that are uh, sort of, you know, believe that Alec Murdoch might be innocent aren't the biggest fans of Eric uh, Bland because he's been very vocal. Sure. But Eric, um, do you think that uh, Buster was coached here by uh, Dick Harpootley and, and Jim Griffin ahead of this interview about what to say in light of the fact that they're now going to appeal for a, a new trial? Um, I, I can't make that statement, but I, I, I am pretty confident that it would hurt his chances on appeal if he came out in this interview and said, you know, my father, uh, I believe that my father killed my mother and brother. I think that would go, that would do a lot of harm to the appeal and to a lot of the public who may believe that there was reasonable doubt at the trial and, and that Alex may uh, have not been proven guilty. I don't know about innocent. I mean, you know, his own brother Randolph has said, Alex clearly knows who killed, uh, if he didn't do it, he knows who killed Maggie and Paul because he was at the kennels and has come out and told the New York Times that he's hiding key facts about what happened. So, no, I, I don't know that he was coached. I, I can't make that assumption, but I can make the assumption that it, it would not have boded well if he came out and said, my dad did this. And uh, Sarah Ford, I love that you jumped right in because Sarah is a uh, victim's advocate through and through. It doesn't matter which side, what team, what it is. Uh, she will uh, she will speak her mind when it comes to that. Um, Sarah, do we know anything more about this potential juror misconduct um, that's potentially swirling around this case that, you know, Dick and Jim are going to try to highlight tomorrow at this press conference? I, mean, I think there's just a lot of speculation and rumor that's kind of floating out there, but I, I don't know anything solid. I mean, they kind of brought this issue up during the trial, didn't they? I mean, if, if this is not something new that they're learning, I mean, I don't know that it's going to have any value, but I mean, they're sure making it seem like it with a press conference right after Labor Day, very dramatic, right at the, you know, after this uh, documentary has, has definitely uh, jumped the in there. Everybody's watching him. it. Uh, so, and so I don't know. I mean, him shooting himself. It's the today is the anniversary of him shooting himself either today or yesterday. Yeah, it was. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just a lot of, you know, I don't know if it's just part of the drama of, you know, kind of what the performance that Dick and Jim seem to give associated with this particular case or not. Um, but I, I mean, I got me. I mean, I'm a lawyer. I'm interested to see what they have to say. But let me tell you, I mean, as far as, you know, getting a new trial, I mean, that is incredibly rare, particularly this far after the fact, uh, if it had anything to do with any of the information that was previously presented um, during the trial, you know, with that witness and or rather that juror that was dismissed, um, you know, we're going to we're going to we got a lot to see here. But I mean, I'm not expecting anything dramatic to come from this. I'm expecting a dramatic press conference because that's just what we expect to see. But something legally uh, remarkable. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't, we'll see. Um, Dr. Raj, since uh, I don't want to get the lawyers uh, all worked up. And well, I don't wait a minute. One thing I want to say about the lawyers, have you guys ever coached anybody you've dealt with? We have see, an obligation, I, I, a question, we have an obligation to prepare. Coaching, I'm you thinking, know. duh, I can't imagine well, hey, a, a high end lawyer not coaching people. Well, it's preparation. We have an obligation oh, okay. to prepare That's, our ooh, good, clients good and word. witnesses. Good word. <laughs> preparation. Has which a, is a negative connotation. Yeah, yeah, I hear it. I hear it. Yes, okay. Raj, how about this question from Mo and Ben? We're going to get right to STS Nation. Do She's asking South Carolina attorneys, but I'm asking the South Carolina therapist. Do you have any thoughts on why Dick Harpootley and Jim Griffin would be sticking their necks out for a liar, thief, convicted murderer? Have you ever seen anything like these shen shenanigans? Uh Raj, from your perspective as a yeah. therapist, not a lawyer, what, what's going on here in your opinion? 
Well, uh, the, the nice word would be grandstanding. That's what's going on, you know, that and uh, people that are very aware of what's called a new cycle and getting on the wave of the new cycle. It's just very interesting, the timing. Uh, this was already mentioned, and I think that's a piece of it. I think that uh, this is nothing new. We're not going to hear anything new. I don't think people are going to be surprised, uh, but they're going to do it in a dramatic fashion. They, they, the timing is very suspect here. Uh, old Lady Snoop, we're going to get I, a lot of these. OM, yeah, real quick, Collier. Let me read this. It's about you. OMG, it's Collier definitely coming to watch. It's the blue <laughs> eyes and the locks. Collier, say what you have to. So one of the things that my father interestingly, interestingly did with his brother. So my my father went to, was in the Navy. My, 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 his brother was as well in a very high security clearance. After my father was convicted and was sentenced to prison, my uncle, who was – who was like best friends with my mother. He came out and said that he saw my mother three days after she was murdered in Washington, DC, and then started promoting all this propaganda, which was obviously, you know, utterly fanciful. She was murdered. I heard it happen. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so many ways. So when you speak about Dick and, and, uh, and the other attorney, Jim Griffin, you know, I'm not saying that they're being manipulated, but when you think about people like Buster and you think about how good psychopaths are, at manipulating people and circumstances. And my father did that to, for his, his own brother to stick his neck out. And ultimately the judge said, if you ever say this again, I'm going to have you arrested, you know, and it, but it, it's, he was trying to go for an appeal, which he, you know, did. And he also tried to say that I was coached and he still says that to this day saying that I, they planted the idea of my, of the murder happening in my home that I heard happen. And I'm, and that's just that's this is completely false because I heard it happen. I'm the one that alerted the police. You know what I mean? And then testify. But it's it's interesting the maneuvering that happens. And I often look at this particular case and think about how my father's case would have been handled in this day and time. That were that's that's what I got. That's that's a really interesting point. I mean, there's a ton of ton more scrutiny social media. Um, you know, everyone knows Eric Bland these days because uh, he's uh, ubiquitous. Um, he's being interviewed. Uh, he's on Twitter. He's been followed on Twitter. So it's a different world for sure. Um, I'm wondering, Sarah Ford, uh, what the word is on the street in South Carolina. This is a question that everyone's asking. Some are not asking it out loud. But how much did Buster Griffin and Harpootlian get paid for the interview? Do we even know, Sarah, at this point, if they were paid? Are, are you hearing anything? Your guess is as good as mine. I mean, I, I have no idea whether they were paid or, or not. Um, I'm going to say mean, no. <laughs> Most of the time I would say no, but I mean, I think just the, them being there and getting out there, I mean, that to a, a national audience, I, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that they've been paid. I mean, I think there's talk of that, but I mean, people think that people get paid for going on podcasts and stuff too. I mean, maybe some people do, I don't know. I mean, to be clear, Fox nation is different than Fox news, it's obviously the same parent company, but I'm sure they have more uh, leeway with their standards and practices. I'm not saying that they did get paid, but the uh, chances of them being paid are much greater on Fox nation. I would say than it would be with Fox news, uh, which has supposed to be following uh, strict standards and practices as do the uh, other networks uh, real quick. Uh, check this out. Collier. Hello, SDS Nation. Becky's a friend of the show. Best guess as usual off topic, but I live in Mansfield or lived in Mansfield when Dr. Uh, Boyd killed uh, Collier's mom. He was so brave on the stand. That's interesting. So uh, you. she remembers you Thank from you uh, way, way back when. Um, can I so, can I just jump in with that? The payment thing? Yeah, because yeah, I, yeah. I think it's, you know, so. Tara Newell, who's of Dirty John fame, we do this podcast, you know, uh, Sur um, Survivor Squad, right? And we talk to survivors of violent crime, you know, uh, whether it be domestic assault, abuse, murder, what, what have you, anything. And there's this there's this thing that people somehow think. And as someone, you know, I've, as you know, Joel, I've worked in the entertainment business for 15, 20 years, right? And made my film A Murder in Mansfield. There is this sort of delusion that exists in society that people who are somehow victims of this are somehow raking in the dollars by selling books, getting paid on interviews, getting out there. And you and I know you, you have a relationship with Fox. I've worked with them. They are very penurious. So if they got paid anything at all, we're talking 
five, 10 grand, you know, it's not like they're getting million dollar paydays. It's, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's very rare that that happens. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, and I believe Carrie Rawson has even come out and said this about people just assuming that she's just raking in money when she does interviews. It's just not true. It's a very unfair thing to paint because often victims and survivors are painted with this, this broad stroke of like, look at them cashing in. I mean, I most certainly have. And, you know, it, it just doesn't happen, you know, and I made a documentary and I did, you know, it, so it's just something to think about that when you start to, when you, when people are maybe making these accusations or making these assumptions rather about victims of violent crime that are coming on speaking, it, it's just it, like Dateline doesn't pay people or very rarely they pay, you know, and it's not much, you know, so, you know, just something to think about. Fair point. We had, here, we had Carrie, we had Carrie, Joel. Go ahead, so Eric. The difference here is that Dick Carpootlian is a very strong liberal Democrat, a Democrat through and through his entire life, who has said a lot of things about Fox News. Now, I don't know about Fox Nation. So the only thing that I would say is I have no idea whether they got paid. I have heard rumors there was payment, but those are just rumors. What does surprise me is Dick Carpootlian would appear on Fox Nation as opposed to more uh, other mainstream type uh, broadcasting agencies that he usually appears on. It's just to see Dick Harputlian on Fox Nation as the sole place where he gave an interview is surprising to a number of people, but I don't know whether they were paid. But he was also in the other documentaries, wasn't he? In Murdoch Murders, The Low Country, which was on HBO. Was he not on, the, on the, any of these other uh, other uh, docuseries? Because Netflix did one, HBO did the first one. Jim Griffin appeared on one, but not Dick. Dick did. Dick hasn't been on camera much. Got it. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, the, the point Eric raises is interesting. Um, I think the bottom line is none of us except them know if they're getting paid. My hunch is that they got paid something. I don't know what. Um, but again, that is just a hunch. Um, and uh, I guess in due time, we may or may not find out. Uh, Dr. Raj, I want to get back to all this circling back around. That is uh, Ski Hat Sarah without the ski hat. Uh, Rod, she says, is it terrible that I wouldn't hate another Murdoch trial? It was pretty dang entertaining. Um, this is a very honest comment, Rod. Yeah, uh, very. Uh, but, Rod, we're talking about uh, murders, real victims here. I know this probably bothers Sarah Ford. who has got that. She's making that face already. But, Rod, <laughs> to you, what about the fact that, um, you know, we were to contribute? I don't want to sound like... Um, I'm immune because what we do a true crime podcast six nights a week. But um, do we have to have a reality check here that these are real victims? Um, maybe we don't want another trial. Maybe we don't want to see this all play out again. Uh, people like Buster would have to relive it. Uh, the memories of Maggie and Paul uh, are obviously involved in all this. What do you say? I say we've forgotten that there once was a Roman Colosseum in which they fought and people paid to come in and watch. I mean, the history, yeah, people love it. People love gore. People love people in pain because it allows them. That's, that's, Joel, that's why when you drive down the highway, you slow your car to look at a wreck, you know, so you can go, well, thank God that's not me. That's this, you know, is this another, uh, you know, nobody wants, um, oh gosh, what's the Kevin Costner show? Uh, Yellowstone. Yellowstone. This is hey, this is another episode of Yellowstone. God, I want another episode. That's the Murdoch trial. Where's the next episode? That's the nature of people. They they love that, and it allows them to sit back and feel safe. And thank God, I'm not part of that crazy family. You know, wow, what what a what a burden, what a huge burden. But love, but, do, love, love but, Dr. Rogers takes Maxi Doodle. No way, Dick is a damn. Are you sure, Eric? Uh, he's uh, in the uh, South Carolina Senate. Eric is sure. Um, I'm sorry, Collier. Were you trying to bounce in there? He was yeah, the head was of the state say, Democratic I mean... Party. He was the head of the state Democratic Party for five <laughs> years. He's run uh, for numerous public offices and he's the right hand man of Biden and Obama. Uh, he's the third phone call to, from Joe Biden. He's Sarah will tell you he's a Democrat. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Collier. Well, I was going to say, you know, also going back to that, you know, with the payment, I mean, obviously them just getting their face out there, you know, it, 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 it advances their agenda, whatever that mm. is. Right. So yeah. that's worth a lot more than a check from Fox, I would assume. 
But, you know, as I'm sure Sarah is going to chime in, of course, you know, and as Roger accurately pointed out is, yes, people want to see the Coliseum. Absolutely. I talk about it a lot. You know, they want to see the Coliseum. But the fact of the matter is, is that this re-traumatizes not only like you're talking about the family and the victims, but the community as a whole. You know, that's the thing, and that's what I did with my film A Murder in Mansfield was I wanted to look at the impacts of what violence and how that affects communities and the ancillary victims that we don't see or talk about, right? And when you continue to perpetuate this and bring this up, and if there is a retrial, like that's just a whole re-traumatization of not only the victims' families, the children who are involved, you know, uh, Buster, point. Yeah. And, and then the community as a whole, who probably really wants to move away from this. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, don't say that. Because there's people, where, where this all happened is a tiny place in South Carolina, a poor place. If there's people there that have made money because of that trial and you don't believe they continue to want to make money, you're delusional. Well, I, I and also my I, I grew up in a small town called Mansfield, which is not as small anymore. But at the time, there's about twenty thousand people in the county, yeah. so I do understand the small town. You know, I grew up you know, essentially in the middle of nowhere in Ohio, right? Um, but so we have prisons there. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a great. I mean, that's a great point. That's a great point. I mean, Shawshank Redemption was filmed there. If you you know, that's that's if people know that film. But yeah, you know, the the thing is, is that yeah, there's there is a commerce, but I think there are a lot of people also in the community that are just like, can we just move on from this? Yeah. Oh, I, I think there's both, but you don't, you just don't want to say there's these kind hearted, let's move on. People are the majority. No, they're just a piece of the pie and people who want to make money. If they make another nickel, they're good for the trial. That's Absolutely. another piece. Of the I, I, I understand that. I just, I guess I'm just trying to, again, not paint with broad strokes where people look at this as a cash cow because this is a stain on a community too. And we have to, I'm trying, I'm trying to approach it through a bit of empathy right? And less cynicism, you know, where it's like, oh yeah, everybody's out for a buck. Sure there are, but there are also people that exist in this world that are just like, we just want to move on from this or let's talk about something else, or maybe we need a break, you know, because it is again, re-traumatizing communities, ancillary victims, etc. I digress. And I think there's no doubt that uh, Collier's right about that. It would re-traumatize a lot of people, but I think Raj makes a point too. I mean, people are in it for, there is an entertainment factor. We forget that these are human beings, sadly, uh, and uh, people always want more of the quote-unquote Coliseum. Veronica says she does not want more because she's in California, <laughs> and that would mean she has to wake up. Everyone's got their own motives at 5.30 again to start watching the trial every day. She can't do that again. Um <laughs> And uh, Sarah and I can say safely, um, Joel, this was a blight on our state. We have a lot of good lawyers that toll hard every day for their clients. And, and Alex painted a broad brush with his uh, thievery on his clients. We don't want to go through this again. This was not good for our state. Um, justice was done. Let the appellate court decide what they're going to do with this. But you know, there was a lot of vic there's a lot of victims that don't want this again, but there's people that need their cases tried that are sitting in jail. And if Alex is going to have another seven week trial, you know, they're they, when are the attorneys going to the attorney general going to be able to prosecute other people that are sitting there waiting for their trials? So the Alex show is enough. You know, it's it's enough already. At least I'm talking for myself. I don't want to put words in Sarah's mouth, but I think she would feel the same way. That's a and great that, point. Well, that, 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 I that want to great. speak up for all the Murdoch relatives in the area. I mean, let, let's not act like the family wasn't all interconnected in that area. And to create doubt and bring it back up would be a deal for them. By so the way, that, that they, doctor, they, have, they have motive to want to keep it going. That Dr. Raj Twang, that's from Oklahoma, but he lives and resides in South Carolina. Chris Seamus says, Collier, you're a warrior. Sean B. says, can Collier stand up and let us ladies get a glimpse? You missed that before. He went to adjust the background. Let me say this. If I had Collier's blue eyes, I'd be anchoring the uh, ABC Evening News instead of that <laughs> David Muir, whoever he is. Um, Andy School here says... Uh, Eric, wouldn't we lose Judge Newman now aging out of his seat, if I'm recalling correctly? He, he is retiring or retired already, didn't he, Eric, or planning to retire? At the end of the year, but he's still, he'll, he'll most likely take senior status, and I think he's going to see these cases through to the end. Sarah probably knows it uh, as, as well. We have mandatory retirement in South Carolina for our judges at 72, uh, but they can come back. They can, they can request of the Supreme Court to come back on 
uh, like senior status and like part time. Um, so I can't imagine that that we won't have Judge Newman, uh, you know, with any sort of trials that we may see um, out of everything going on here. But, you know, I, I think I think we're good with Judge Newman for a while. By the way, I never touch politics on the show, but that that senior status might work well in uh, the United States Congress. I'm just saying maybe uh, I don't know, maybe maybe 88 should be a retirement age for uh, the United States Congress. But um, Sarah, for your lips to, to God's ears, Joel, your lips to God's <laughs> ears. Um, by the way, so uh, he was convicted this past March. Alec Murdoch was uh, of these June 7, 2021 murders. Uh, Brian Etten, who everyone knows, is the uh, what just happened to my stuff here. Everything just went haywire here. But uh, Brian Etten is uh, the uh, standout crime reporter. And he tweeted a short time ago, uh, Sarah, for to you. Um, and this direct tweet, I have learned uh, Alex Murdoch's lawyers have been investigating outside influence on jurors for several months. They've uncovered new evidence. I'm going to South Carolina for the press conference tomorrow when Murdoch's attorneys will file the motion for a new trial again. SCS is going to cover that live. Um, Sarah, I know I'm kind of harping on this point, but there was some I, I you know, I didn't watch this as closely as everyone in South Carolina, but there was some business of juror misconduct uh, when the trial originally happened. Right. So do you think that's what the focus is right now, their investigation, or we simply do not know? I mean, I would imagine, I mean, they made a big, huge stink. And I mean, it's been months and months since this happened. So forgive me if I'm not giving all the facts hundred uh, percent correctly here, but there was some contact with a, a juror kind of talking about the trial while the trial was going on, which is an absolute no, no when of, of any juror, you don't discuss it. You don't deliberate. You don't talk about it with anybody, um, you know, while you're on the jury until the judge says, all right, you may now deliberate. Um, and so that was, uh, that information got back to the court. Um, my recollection was they inquired of that particular juror, the, both the prosecutors and the defense attorneys were there. Um, and they decided to release that, that juror. Um, and I think after the fact, it came out that this, this juror was leaning towards them. You know, I, I wasn't sure if the person was, you know, whether Alec was guilty or not guilty. Um, and then it kind of became, well, if that person hadn't been, you know, they wouldn't have gotten the conviction if they'd kept that person. So I'd imagine that that's probably, you know, where they've been, quote unquote, investigating for months. Um, but I mean, you know, I hate to not, I mean, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a journalist, I'm not a news person, but I mean, we'll find out soon enough, I guess, what what they've got. And if they've got something significant, then, you know, the courts will will go through it and see if there's any merit to it. Um, but the, newly, we'll newly discovered evidence could be somebody found the gun. Uh, newly discovered evidence could be something with the phones or something that did not exist or was not known during the trial. It, it, it's a, a rigorous standard. It's tough, but um, I don't think Dick is going to lay this out there and it'd be a dud. It, it, it could have some, some legs. Interesting perspective. And uh, we're all talking about juror misconduct and Eric Bland just brought up. Maybe there's, the gun has been discovered. Who knows? Um, we're going to find out maybe tomorrow. We'll see. Um, back to you, Sarah Ford. This is a legal question from analytical Blarney AB. Why would Buster speak out at all about Stephen Smith, which he did? Uh, he's from a long line of lawyers and speaking out is the first thing lawyers tell you not to do. Why would he have answered those questions, Sarah? Um, I started my career as a as a baby public defender right out of law school. And the number one thing that I learned being a public defender was, thank God people don't listen to their lawyers if you're a cop or a prosecutor, because nobody listens to that. They want to talk. They want to tell their mom. They want to tell their neighbor. They want to say, well, let me just try to explain it because maybe they think they're a little bit smarter than the average person. Or they think that they may know a little bit better. Maybe if I give a little something here, you know people just love to talk. I mean, I'm not, the, you know, Dr. Raj surely can talk about this, but people love to talk. And as a, as a prosecutor, as someone that works with crime victims, I mean, I love that. I think it's great. I love that people love to put all their business on Facebook. Do you know how much that you get as a lawyer from Facebook? Because people want to tell their story. They want to say that. So, I mean, it's, it's his prerogative to do so. You know, I, I think that just kind of brings up the questions because you've got, you know, the people that say, you know, he did have something to do with it. He didn't have something to do with it. You know, it just kind of stirs, keeps the 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 water swirling, if you will. Um, 
but people love to do that. So since, you know. since I represent Sandy Smith, there was one question that I wanted to hear. Um, I don't, I don't think that Buster had anything to do with killing Stephen Smith. I had nothing I've heard would indicate that yes, his name and the family's name is all over the highway department investigative file. But the one question that wasn't asked, he was asked, did you kill Stephen Smith? No. Did you have a relationship with him? No. The real important question is, do you have any knowledge about his death? That's the question that I wanted answered and asked. And answered because I do believe that uh, amongst his friends uh, at that went to school with Stephen Smith, they know what happened to Stephen. I'm not saying Buster had anything to do with it, but I do believe that people in his age bracket have some knowledge about what happened to Stephen. By the way, the people that are making all the money on this is uh, Fox News and Fox Nation and Rupert Murdoch's uh, pockets getting a lot deeper. Go ahead. Not that it, not that he need. Well, maybe he needs a few extra. It should bucks, be an but- episode of Succession. Can they bring that back? But I want to say something. And to your point, Eric, it's good to hear you say that because, you know, I interviewed Dr. Kenny Kinsey on my show after when he was doing the second autopsy and involved in this investigation. And it's like. I I pray so so much for that family that that his mother can have peace with what because for having all these rumors and all this conjecture bounce around the interwebs is is so detrimental to her and I just hope for that they find peace because she can move on but you know it's 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 interesting when you said about Buster answering those questions and I also think there's something interesting to point out is this was not like a live interview that we watched on television. This was a cut piece. So she might have asked him a ton of questions that may have just not made the cut. You know what I mean? Right. We have to keep that. Good and I point. wonder if even that at some point could be subpoenaed by from Fox if there's as part of these interviews, if there is some investigation that leads down the road. I don't live in the low country. I, I live in California by the beach. But, you know, from what I know, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem plausible that that happened. But it, I think it's the rumors that are really hurting her, fam- his mother, from and the family and the community as a whole from moving on. Excellent point, uh, John Swindler. Love your show. I live in Walterboro. Went to see the trial in person twice. Believe the jury made the right decision. Eric and Collier, thank you for all you do. Where would another trial be held? Uh, we don't know that. But uh, Eric Bland, uh, since you mentioned Sandy Smith, you know how is she doing? Um, what's her, you know, what's her uh, kind of state of mind these days? And uh, you know, SLED came out with that big announcement um, declaring it a homicide. Do we know where this investigation stands? Um, I mean, Collier hit it right on the head. She suffers a roller coaster of emotions. You know, in the, the spring, she was very elated and encouraged when SLED came out and said that, the you know, it was a homicide and they were going to devote all the resources that were allocated to Alex's murder. And they uh, they have. And I speak r- frequently with uh, Ch- Chief Keel from SLED, but um, I, you know, I thought there was going to be something by Labor Day, but it, it appears obviously not. And so she is; she's getting a little discouraged. I am confident that there are five people that SLED has focused on that they believe have information. The question is, um, are any of them talking? Last week. Patrick Wilson, who's been identified as a person of interest in the uh, highway department investigative file, was was found in Greenville, South Carolina. There was an outstanding warrant for him for an open container, very modest misdemeanor charge. And he had fled the state. They found him across uh, the state in Greenville, South Carolina, near the mountains. They brought him into Hampton County. He was tried and convicted, and he's still in jail. So I don't know whether they think he has some information, but it's going to take somebody to talk. And I think then we'll find out what happened to Stephen. But, you know, Sandy is suffering a roller coaster of emotions. Mm. Uh, Twyla Olson, and we're going to get into why this question is being asked to you, Sarah Ford. Uh, Did Jim Griffin break the law by smuggling Alex recordings out of jail or just completely unethical? And that brings us to the next bit of news here before we get into the actual Fox Nation interview um, convicted murder. Uh, Alec Murdoch lost his phone privileges as well as his prison tablet, which has got to stink if you're in prison, uh, because Jim Griffin actually was recording him reading his journal entries on a call for a documentary, presumably this documentary uh, that's out now. Um, South Carolina Corrections Department officials announced that 
uh, last week. So, Sarah Ford, um, what about, you know, ethically speaking, that apparently um, and this is all according to reports that, you know, Jim Griffin was uh, recording these conversations when Alex was not supposed to be making them. Well, I think at the bare minimum, it's not a good look for any lawyer to be using their supposedly confidential call with their client to, you know, record that and then, you know, pass those recordings along to Fox Nation or anyone for that matter. There's a there's an important reason why you have those confidential calls. That's why law enforcement doesn't monitor that. And I'm just incredibly frustrated by the fact that a lawyer would do that. Now, is it uh, illegal? I, I don't know that it's illegal. I certainly think that it's uh, it's obviously against the policy of the South Carolina Department of Corrections. Um, but it's certainly not a good look for an attorney to do that. You you absolutely know that you're not supposed to do that. Um, you know, do, I, I've seen a lot of stuff. People, you know, he's going to Jim Griffin needs to be charged. I don't know that Jim Griffin. I don't know what he'd be charged with. Um, so but I do there's a know reason for that rule. There's a reason for that rule, Joel, and Sarah knows it. And that is the reason you can't let a convicted criminal give these interviews is it victimizes the victims all over again. We this rule was enacted so that victims can have peace after a trial. And if you permit Alex Murdoch to go on TV and gives his statement, then the victims get victimized all over again. It is a good rule. And Jim Griffin knows that rule. And uh, there's a lot of lawyers that are troubled. Jim's an honorable guy. He's a former federal uh, judge's law clerk. Um, he's not a flamboyant. He's not a bombastic guy. Former but, prosecutor you know, even. So yeah, during the during the trial, don't forget, he was admonished by Judge Newman for uh, violating the court's order and talking to the press. And so, you know, Jim knows better. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, yeah. Let me write into what I was going to say that is prison policy prohibits inmates from talking to the media without permission because uh, the agency, meaning the prison and the state here, believes that victims of crime should not have to see or hear the person who victimized them or their family members on the news. That's according to prison spokeswoman, Christy Shane, uh, who issued sure. a statement. Yeah. But then, but like, and look, I've spent a lot of time in prison for a man that's free with my father and obviously making a documentary, but prison talk is a whole thing on TikTok where prisoners somehow get access and get, and are going live from the prisons. So it's, it's, and, and I agree with Eric, Absolutely. Like this is the reason why these rules and laws exist is to not re-victimize the, the, the victims and, and the families and re-traumatize everyone. But, you know, this is there are so many ways that, that these criminals can go out there and spread, whether it's deceit, whether it's their cry for help, what have you. It's you know, it's just how inventive are you going to be? And, how, and Alex Murdaugh, when he goes into prison, he is a celebrity in that environment for the rest of his time in prison. Everyone will know who he is because he will go in. People will point out that's the guy that did it. They do it to my father. That's the guy that killed his wife. That's the, that's his son who put him in prison. You know what I mean? I lived through this, and so they're always going to have this sort of elitist kind of access to get their whatever it is out there. My father was just on a podcast not too long ago talking about a technicality on how he was convicted and sentenced on a technicality, never saying anything about like that he didn't commit the murder. There's just there's so many more platforms now out there that I think the justice system is trying to keep, you know, play catch up. And I think maybe, Sarah, you concur with this, Eric. I'm, I'm sure you guys do, you know, to, to be able to sort of regulate that. It's very challenging. Collier, um, I'm curious from you. How do you think uh, Alex being treated in the prison system? Is he uh, like deified as a god in there or does he have a target on his back or both? I think it's probably a little bit of both. You know, they don't typically like people that murder women and children. Uh, but also, it is such a high-profile case that, you know, I, and I do know that he didn't he have an issue where he wanted to be transferred to another state? Or was that just conjecture, like tabloid conjecture? Because I thought I remembered that, him saying he had a rough go of it. But, you know, yeah, it, it is something that he's either going to be out in the yard and he's going to be like, that's the guy, because that will always follow him. And... You know, so I would imagine because I've heard that I've done TikToks about him being on dating sites and, and talking to women. And and so obviously he has access to things to do that. So, yeah, I would say that there are that he probably has much like he had on the outside. He has a chorus of sycophants on the inside as well, whether that be in the administration, whether that be in his fellow inmates 
or, or, or outside those walls, I'm sure he has th the best of both worlds, if you will. Uh, Tali in Israel is watching. She stays up late for this. Uh, I sometimes feel bad for Jim. Raj, this is for you. Okay. Aside from aside from being his attorney, he was a very close friend of the Murdoch family. It must be sad for him to think his close friend could be responsible for this shameful crimes and lies. What about that dynamic that he was a friend, Jim Griffin, still is, I guess, of Alec Murdoch's? Well, that that's what some people are really missing about this. That this happened in a small area, rural area of South Carolina. Okay, that's number one. Number two, my phone is standing up. God, I just lost. Okay, there we go. God, technology, I love it. Okay, but but the the other thing is is that you, you know there is a lot of victimization going on. And I, can, I have no problem believing that people will do things for a dollar bill that are unethical. As much as they'll say, man, when people start, you know, showing the green, people start changing their attitude and the way they say, golly, dang. <laughs> it, would be, it would be STS without Raj doing all this. I love man, it. Man, this is bad. I feel like I need to ride up in my horse for this show. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, it's... It, the system, the people who run it, uh, even the, the high-level lawyers, uh, when you start waving money in front of their face, thing, the whole atmosphere of the situation changes. And you know, we're going we're gonna to play some clips from uh, the Buster Murdoch interview in a minute. There's one more thing to get to, but uh, Raj, I'd love for you, this Andy School is a friend of the show. Uh, Dr. Raj, do you feel many of us here at STS Nation are interested in true crime or are in it because we've been impacted by it ourselves, either by profession, family, friends, or so on. Bottom line question is, why are people intrigued by true crime, Raj? Oh, we, you know. <laughs> I went away on this too. That's, a, that's kind of a deep psychological issue because, you know, in the basic system of people, uh, way back in the early, early days, people were interested in crime. I mean, media has just made it more accessible but this has always been a part of the nature issues of how people are gr drawn to uh, being junior detectives. People love being junior doctors, love being junior lawyers, junior detectives, uh, and so that, that, that they can come up with the right answer and be involved. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a morbid element of curiosity in people that we all have. And I, one of the things I've noticed about in this show that the viewer is very interested in the feeling of people personally involved, you know, yeah. that have their own story. Uh, they seem to be much more on top of that than uh, the story itself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing a talk about this at CrimeCon in a couple of weeks uh, with Tara Newell because we do Survivor Squad. And I was never, when I made my film, it wasn't a, supposed to be a true crime film. It was about the human impact of violence, right? And my story. Yeah. And, you know, confronting my father. And the, the thing is, is that I did not realize how many people were obsessed with this. But mm -hmm. I, so I sort of, you know, even though I was doing a true crime podcast, I was sharing my own stories. And I have an ethical sort of issue with some people that don't have any experience sharing things, Right. Or, or aren't getting down to the facts or just kind of blatantly telling stories and, and sort of not getting the facts straight. You know, that happens. And, and obviously it's going to happen in podcasting and things of that nature. But we're that dynamic is changing. But one of the things that I discovered in doing this type of work is that people want to hear these stories and, and see and learn of people that get justice because they haven't had that for themselves. They may have had a rough go. They may have grown up in a cycle of abuse or, or might not have gotten justice for themselves in a similar situation where the case has gone through the court system and, and you know, just kind of disappeared. Somebody like, a, like Sandy Smith, Stephen Smith's mother, who might glean hope that other people have gotten justice. So that makes them feel a part of that and that they too have hope. And that even if they didn't get what they're looking for, they, they see that in others and that helps them move on in their own personal trauma. Yeah, yeah. I want to add point. that. That state, let me just jump in. Seeking justice, well, what a powerful emotional motivator. You know, any kind of justice. 
it's amazing how people can glean positive elements from other people's uh, justice moments. But I think it's also important, I mean, to both of your points, I think it's really important for us to think, we have to think differently about trauma. You know, I may not be the victim that fell in the pool, okay? I'm, I just saw this happen. But when that person gets out of the pool and hugs me, I'm going to be all wet. I'm going to have the, have that vicarious trauma. That's kind of how I think about trauma. That's how I teach it sure. in classes. Yeah. And so, you know, when we're looking at trauma in that way, you don't have to have been a victim, quote unquote victim. Uh, you could have just been a friend. You could have been an officer. You could have been a lawyer working with someone. That There are ways that that trauma can affect you and it does affect you. And I think that, that so many people live with this trauma, whether it's, you know, a direct trauma, whether it's vicarious trauma, whether it's something from their childhood, whatever the case may be. And so bonding with other people who have that similar um you know, detail in their story and are working towards that and seeing justice and having that moment with with others to seek justice and to to realize that that you are not defined by whatever that trauma was um, and that you can, as you say, call you know, moving beyond that, that it's possible. And so I think that's why we see so much of it. It's not necessarily that that everyone has been the victim of a violent crime, but we've all been affected by it some way. We're all wet from that from that we are that i love that i'm going to use that I, analogy by the way but that's um, absolutely correct is that we all collectively experience these things and and when you see that in other people it gives you hope i mean i wish i had that growing up i had to figure that out myself i didn't have those stories there were no true crime podcasts there was unsolved mysteries you know what i mean it, i i didn't know that that, that i was going to make it through i was just like i'm going to figure this out you know, I was abandoned by my entire family. Nobody, I went to a foster care system. You know, nobody cared about me. You know what I mean? So it was like this for, for a period of time, I was alone dealing with all of this and I had to figure it out. I wish I would have had something like that growing up where I'd be like, okay, I'm going to make it through because that guy did or that girl did or that family did, you know, and we're going to all heal because it's amazing to see that. And that's a great, uh, great point because Buster puts on a good face, but you got to wonder how lonely he feels in this world right now. I mean, he lost so his alone mother, and so confused. Yeah. And the cognitive dissonance yeah. that's going on in his head is is insane. Yeah. yeah and I think we all uh, overlooked that to a degree. Margaret, thank you for the super sticker. There must be inmates I hear his father responsible for. Won't this make him a target? I guess that's possible. A glimpse into my world. Everyone's asking for Collier's picture to be bigger on the screen. Then Leah Baker yells at me, stop showing dumb comments. This is serious, followed right by this one. Can you enlarge Collier by 10x? They want him on IMAX. I got Leah Baker hating me. I've got Sean B. begging for Collier to be big. Look at that. There he goes, trying to enlarge it. Um, Another bit of news, believe it or not, before we get to this interview that I want to get to, um, and this is sort of your wheelhouse here, uh, Eric Bland, but Alec Murdoch, he's going to plead guilty to $8 million in financial financial crimes. It's going to be the first crime that he actually admits in court to committing. Apparently, this uh, guilty plea is going to happen September 21st uh, in the court of law. Uh, each crime carries a max 20 years in prison. Some say, well, he's already in there for life, Eric Bland. But in your opinion, why is it important uh, that he pleads guilty here uh, and fesses up to committing these financial crimes, some of which were against your own clients? It's gaming. Uh, Dick is trying to game it so that he gets the murder conviction reversed for a new trial. Alex has pled guilty in a federal, uh, under federal prison, federal court, and he wants to serve his time in a federal prison. So if the state court charges get reversed, then he will go start serving his time in a federal prison. And Dick believes that he can beat the murder charge again. And so Alex is, knows that he's never going to see the light of day, but he wants to do it in a federal prison instead of a maximum security state prison where he's in a six by six cell. And now, you know, he's lost his canteen privileges, his phone privileges. So what, what's going to happen is it, it's trying to game it so that um, he can get the state court trial reversed. Now, that's why the state uh, prosecution is going forward to make sure he's convicted of the state financial crimes, but it's all trying to game it out uh, on a chessboard and they want him to serve his time in a federal prison the same way that Corey Fleming is starting to serve his time in a federal prison. Sarah, for you agree with that game in the system. I mean, 
I'm not built for prison, but if I were, I definitely want to go to federal prison instead of state prison. <laughs> I mean, I've been have been in a lot of South Carolina prisons to visit. Um, I want to go home to my bed and a steak dinner if I want that. Uh, not saying that that's what the federal prison is like, but it's certainly uh, a better environment than the South Carolina Department of Corrections. No disrespect mm-hmm. to the great job that our men and women of, of SCDC uh, do, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everyone, everyone says that across the board. Um, Rod, you worked inside the prison systems, Rod. Yes. But, uh, Adam Lamparello here with a super sticker. Thank you. Uh, this is in your wheelhouse, uh, Raj. What do you think drives someone who is so successful to commit such crimes? I mean, on paper, Alec Murdoch was living the perfect life. Kids, wife, lots of money. Uh, some, I guess, that he was stealing. But uh, what, what led him to this uh, dark path? He came from a culture of invincibility, you know, that that he was in a power uh, setup in that area. He was from a power family and he operated in a powerful way. And I believe he felt at his core, he was untouchable. You know, you hear people all the time say, well, I could kill him and I can get away with it. Uh, You know, they're just blowing it off. But I believe in his heart, that's what he believed, that that his wife and his son were in the way and they they were expendable. The question uh, Tracy of why, Jones, go ahead, the question, the question, sorry to interrupt, the question of why is what is going to haunt Buster Murdaugh his entire life. It haunted me because my father was a successful doctor. He was becoming more and more successful. He was divorcing my mother. He had a 20, 20, his girlfriend was 20 years younger than him. They had a baby on the way. And he just was such a narcissist and a psychopath. He couldn't let it go. And it haunted me my entire life. It's like, it's like you had everything. You know, there was even a joke with the police officer who I'm still very close to, who, you know, I wanted him to adopt me, him and his family. And I was adopted to a wonderful family after being in the foster care system for about a year. So I just wanted to make that statement. But the fact is, is that I, we would joke, of, make a joke of like, my mother should have been the one to off him. You know what I mean? But he wanted to bury her underneath the basement of his home so she could always be under his feet. It's about control. It's about manipulation. It's a, it's the psychopathy, which a lot of people can't understand. And they need to feel really good about that, that they don't understand that <laughs> because it's, it's a terrible place to be. And I think that that's where that, that, that pulls and that cognitive dissonance comes in with what Buster has to be feeling. I mean, I can see it in his eyes. I watched that whole thing yesterday. I can see it in his eyes. He is torn inside because he, he, uh, he loves his father. I love my father. I forgive my father, but I, but I love my father. I don't want, I didn't want this to happen. I don't want him to, to die in prison. I don't want that to happen, but he made those choices as did Alec Murdoch, at least as far as the courts are concerned. And, you know, he was convicted and, and this is what this is. And he's, so he's trying to rationalize in his head and he's going to be, this is going to be plaguing him for years. And I hope that he can find some solace in, in all of this, but it's going to take a long time. It took me sitting across from my father in my film to finally ask him, why did you do this? Which of course he, you know, well, I won't spoil it for the audience, but he, you know, he couldn't tell me, you know what I mean? There's just no way that the, cause you can't understand the mentality but it will haunt him. And that's the thing that we all try to wrap our minds around, whether it be in true crime, whether it be at this case, whether you are a victim, an advocate, et cetera. We all try to look at that and be like, why does this happen? That's yeah, and I've, and I've, I've had that conversation. jump off. All yeah, Joel, I'm, at the bottom I'm jump line. Off, okay, hang, Raj, hang on one sec. Oh, okay. Eric Bland, thank but, you but very before much. Before I do, before yeah. I do, I want to say that Collier is 100% correct. It, you know, um, Buster is going to have to reflect on this for the rest of his life. Like, how did this happen? How did I not see my father act in the way that he's now admitting that he did, that he stole from clients, that he lied to his brother? You know, don't forget, he lied to Buster for two solid years about not seeing his mother and his brother the very last minute of their life at the kennel. He took 42 minutes to call Buster on the phone to tell him that his mother and brother died. And he called friends first and did some internet searches. So Buster's got a tough life ahead of him. And I, if I was Buster, this Myrtle name, Collier, I don't know your last name, but my last um, name was Boyle. And I, and I I go by Landry. I'm sure it lived in infamy for a while. It it still does. It still does. 
Buster may actually have to change his last name or get a new name because the Murdoch name is so tarnished and so such a lightning rod, it's going to be difficult for him to get a fair shake in life. Mm. Uh, really well said, Eric. Eric, I always appreciate you coming on the show. I figured out finally after all these years how to get rich. I'm going to sell cutouts of Eric Bland and Collier in my merch store, and that is going to get me <laughs> incredibly wealthy. Uh, Bland, Eric, nice, to meet you too. nice chatting with you. Have a great one. We're, we're going to continue on without Eric. Thanks, Eric. Um, Cynthia Ann says Collier avenged his mama's life that was taken from him and then was turned away by his own family. Despicable behavior by relatives. He is turned his loss into helping others through life and trauma. Uh, Dr. Raj, I mean, we just had Carrie Rawson on. Uh, she is the daughter of the notorious serial killer, uh, Dennis Rader, BTK. And she told us she she had a face-to-face -face meeting with him. Their uh, investigations heating up into new potential crimes. She had a face-to-face -face meeting with him in uh, the prison system in Kansas. Uh, and he began to sob uncontrollably when he saw his little daughter Um People make horrible mistakes. Uh, they can be psychopaths and sociopaths, but uh, there's still a love there between uh, a father and a son or a daughter and a, and, uh, and a father. Correct, Roger? Well, without a doubt. And, and at the core of this, uh, in, in all situations, who wants to really understand mentally ill people? I mean, that, that's what separates us. Uh, and that's what just fascinates me, how you know, people that, that have regular thought uh, want to understand people who have disturbed thought. Uh, that is just, I, I don't get that, but that's just the way it works. But, you know, that, that there's no way people love to act like they understand. They really don't. You can't understand people who do not think in a regular way. It, that means you'd have to get inside their brain and you can't do that. Well, and, but people keep trying to do that. Sure. And let's also, let, let's maybe delineate that comment because, you know, or, or because you're saying mentally ill, like not all mentally ill people behave in this manner. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? and, oh. And, and, and let's not vilify them because there are many, there are millions of people who struggle with mental illness. They right, don't choose right. to, to annihilate their entire family. So we want to, because again, language is so powerful these yeah. days. We want to, yeah. we want to really, again, bifurcate that and say, this is somebody who suffers from narcissistic personality disorder, which is narcissism, malignant narcissism, uh, uh, you, um, um, psychopathy, sociopathy, those character disorders, right? And I even confront my father and ask him that. I say, do you think you're a sociopath? And he goes, no, because a sociopath is someone with character disorder. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I turn if, to the cameras. They, I'm like, if, they, what? if they had that ability to effectively uh, evaluate themselves, they, they wouldn't do what they do, you know, and, and I'm sorry for painting a broad picture of mental illness, but th the fact is, is that to do what many people do, you cannot think in a rac a rational, regular manner that they have a different brain operation than Absolutely. most people. Absolutely. Hey, doc, Dr. Raj, so I come from a very loving family, mother, father. I had a, my family intact. I have a sister with valedictorian of her high school, went on to become a doctor. I could barely get through life. And then you got Collier here. His whole back, his life was shattered. Uh, and look at this guy. He's got it all together. Um, <laughs> how, how's, how's, he, how's he have it all together the way he does, Dr. Raj, in your opinion? By the way, Carla Riley says generous, by the way. Panel. That's generous. Nah, uh, Raj, what do you, what do you make of uh, a guy who's he's the the product of a uh, a father that murdered his mother, and look how I mean he he's got his life uh, seemingly together. And I've talked to Collier, we're yeah. friends. Um, he's got I don't, his, I'm not together. saying he doesn't have his life together, but there there you know the old saying: there's people out there that can take lemons and turn them into lemonades, mm -hmm. and there there's where we're that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, is was this were there all this terrible stuff? Yes. And he had a conscious choice what he was going to do with it. And I think you see the product of the direction he took. You know, that, but there are people that, you know, uh, get wet from somebody getting, getting out of the water who, who carry the wetness with them because they've made that their identity.
They have no other identity but that. And it's, it's a dysfunctional identity. Hour and four minutes. We're going to finally get into some of the interviews. Sarah, I'm coming right to you. But real quick, I, um, <laughs> Autumn Blaze says, uh, Buster uh, and Collier, I'm curious to get your take on this. Buster has to accept his father is a murderer first before the question of why can haunt him. Do you agree with that? Um, well, first of all, I just want to say, Roger, thank you for your kind words. I was trying not to cry because um, I am without a doubt a product of my mother. And, and it, it's a testament to her being in my life for a very short period of time, you know, and what she instilled in me. And then for obviously making choices and, and doing things. But like, you know, it, it took a lot to get here. Right. OK, wait, 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 wait. Let me let me just interrupt. Uh, I'm glad your mother threw you great thoughts. But also, I want you to take credit for that. You had a catcher, an emotional catcher's mitt, and you you grab the good thoughts and kept yeah. them, you know, in sure. your head. That that's Absolutely. that's that's called character. Well, thank you. Know? you. I appreciate that. By the way, Sean um, B says Buster ain't no Collier. Fact. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I know I just asked you a question, Collier, but we're off the rails. Well, as we well the, no, the, the, the thing. Well, the thing is, is that like so he has. It, does he have to accept that his father is a murderer? I mean, that's a great that's a great question because I accepted that my father was a murderer because I heard it happen and I testified against him, but I still tried to cultivate and cultivated a relationship with him for almost 30 years, right? And obviously all culminating to make a film and things of that nature. But, you know, he, he yeah, I mean, he might have to accept that. He at least... Look, it's just happened. You know, he's he's dealing with so much with with and, and and as Eric had mentioned, you know, even the fact that he held up until that last minute of testimony that he really was at the kennels four, five, six minutes before they lost their lives, right? And so now he has to reconcile that deception. I mean, he there's so many layers to this onion that you just it's not a one shot size fits all. You know, I can tell him all the things in the world, but he has to peel that onion back for himself to say, okay, I'm going to deal with this today. Okay, he deceived me. So could, could he have killed mom and Paul? Maybe. But then I see this with the trial. Then I have the community saying this. Then Dick and Jim are saying this. My father says this because I know his father gaslights him because I, before the trial, when I watched those two documentaries on the first one, or actually the, the first one, Low Country, on HBO, I when he, they're doing the prison call at the end and he says to him, he's like, talking about his girlfriend, right? And he says, yeah, we were out late last night. And he goes, oh, y'all doing drinking? I remember when when mama would get buzzed up. I mean, that, this is my bad Southern Alec Murdoch <laughs> accent. <laughs> when that, mama mama would get, get buzzed Mama would get buzzed up. You know, oh, hey, it was really funny. She was funny like that. And I could just hear him say, yeah. Like he was just processing all this. Uh, and my father would say the same thing. He will say, because I read letters on my podcast on Moving Past Trauma and on my channel where my father says the same thing. It's this gaslighting of, well, I remember meeting your mother and she she took her glasses down and looked over the brim of her the glasses at me. And I it was love at first sight. And he romanticizes this whole story, this whole love story. And it's like, you you murdered her. Not only did you murder her, you were a womanizer their entire relationship. You had multiple girlfriends on the side all the time, consistently. And, you know, so he's, again, it's this peeling back of the onion of the deception. And I can hear his father's ho hooks in him, but he's him just trying to rationalize all this. And it's going to take a while. And I don't know what that first step is. is it, does it say, okay, he did this? I think he has to, he has to really come to terms with, I'm not my father, <laughs> which takes a long time, but also of... I need to find some, whatever variation of the truth that I can live with, I have to do. Because right now, he's probably saying, why wasn't I there? What could I have done to stop this? Was my dad addicted to drugs and did this? Should we have really put our foot down? Should somebody have inter 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 intercepted him in a way, or should we have had an intervention and gotten him away from all this? Should we have known, oh, I remember him spending all this money one time. I was like, why are you spending all this money? I should have known something. He's playing the coulda, shoulda, woulda. I did it, and I was a 11 years old the night that I heard my father murder my mother. My father is six foot four, 230 some pounds, and I was an 11 year old asthmatic boy. And I would play back in my head for years, why didn't I do something to stop this? But, and I would have been, I would have, you know, and, and when he was in the doorway, 
when he stopped in my doorway that night, and if I know if I have looked up, he would have put me in the same hole with her. It takes nothing to make it the hole a little bigger and say, she left with the kid. You know what I mean? And so those are all these types of thoughts that go through your head. When, when, and that's what he's experiencing. Obviously a different scenario, but still the same. And wow. you're, it's, again, this cognitive dissonance, as I've said. But. And, and that, that is chilling. Um, Collier's got stories for days. Kristen Grogan, do you have a channel, Collier? Sounds like we had a similar childhood. Yours ended badly. I love your outlook and take on this. this is insightful. Uh, what's Co uh, Collier's last name and podcast? It is Landry. He's got two podcasts, Moving Past Trauma, Moving Past Murder, and, uh, sorry, Moving Past Murder and Survivor Squad. Do I have it right, Collier? Yeah, I was just putting it in the comments. So I have a YouTube channel. It's at Collier Landry. All my social media is at Collier Landry. It's Moving Past Trauma Podcast. And then I host Moving Past, um, uh, sorry, uh, Survivor Squad with Tara Newell, who you guys all know from Dirty John fame. Yeah, and see, he screwed it up too. But uh, I have it in the uh, in the YouTube summary. There you go. It's oh, a little out of focus, it but Survivor focus. Squad is what it says. Uh, Sarah <laughs> Ford, um, I know we were talking uh, like, like, wild people uh, did you you had a comment a while back you want to slip that in there and then we'll get to some uh buster murdoch sound i think a lot of times we like to throw out words like this person is a narcissist this person is mentally ill because we as we regular humans we we want to think with our brain and try to rationalize the irrational. And you just can't do that when you're looking at someone who has murdered their family or has committed violent crimes. You just can't do that. And I think that's why some people often say, well, there's no way that a father would kill their child, or there's no way that a mother would do X, whatever that may be. But you're looking at that with your glasses, with your lens, with your experience. So I think it's really important that a, we not put, uh, we, we try to rationalize based on, on our, um, our lives, our focus, our lenses. Um, I, I think that that's key. And number two, you know, people who commit crimes are not necessarily mentally ill. And I think that we want as, as people to feel safe in our own homes, in our own communities, we want to say, well, that person is mentally ill. That person is crazy. That person did, you know, because it makes us feel better because then we're thinking, well, if they're not, that could be someone I go to school with or I go to church with or who's my neighbor. And okay. that's the key that I see and we see on a daily basis is that there oftentimes there's no script. There's no character description that says this person is going to turn out to murder their wife and son. They can look like successful people. They can look like, uh, you know, someone who, who makes millions of dollars, who has everyone's attention and affection and accolades, and they've won all of these awards. But that doesn't mean they're not going to commit a violent crime against the people that they love the most. And so when I'm on panels like this, I just like to throw that out there because I, I'm a lawyer. I work with victims. But so often we want to, to put our what we think on other people. And I think that's really dangerous. Um, that also know. separates them too, as you were saying. And all, you know, and it's like people also commit crimes out of desperation. A father of four who can't feed his family will go rob a liquor store or steal a car thinking it's a good idea. Somebody brings in a kilo of heroin from South America because they think they can sell it on the street and get themselves out of debt. You know what I mean? People do things all the time. I, I, I totally, I absolutely agree with that, especially like desperation. You know, uh, and we don't want to paint them with that again with that broad brush. Mm. I think we just gotta, you know, recognize that we we may not understand why we may not Buster Murdoch may never rationalize it or understand why his dad did this or coming to terms with it based on what we think coming to terms with looks like. Uh, I just hope that he he finds some peace for his own sake dealing with this incredible trauma that he's dealing with and a father who is looks like he's serving the remainder of his life in, in the state penitentiary. And what does the relationship for him look like? Because I also encourage that for him if he wants that. You know what I mean? If he wants to cut off all contact, he can do that. If he doesn't, you know, it, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. And it's also one that only him, only Buster can determine. And he can set those boundaries with his father and, and with others around him. Um, you know, be, while he continues to heal and, you know, he has a young lady, he has a girlfriend that's still with him. I think she was there this entire time. You know, they've got to think about their, he's 27 years old. They got to think about their future and what that looks like with children, et cetera. If he chooses to go down that road, there's a lot of things 
that um you know and I, even still i don't understand why my father did it and but i realized like i will never understand that right i will never understand that and that's okay that's okay <laughs> mm. Uh, by the way, someone said that Buster should reach out to Collier and Collier already commented. Buster can reach out to me anytime. So uh, anytime. Buster Murdoch, if you're listening to this, uh, surviving the survivor at gmail.com and I'll put you in touch with Collier Landry. Uh, someone Find here me on the socials, that, DM me. Yeah, DM uh, Collier and uh, someone said Collier is a great role model. So finally, uh, people are asking, well, where is this video with Buster live? So it is uh, on Fox Nation, uh, my old employer, Fox News. Uh, it's called Fall of the House of Murdoch. He sat down with Fox News anchor Martha McCallum, who hosts a lot of the debates. Uh, this is one piece of sound where he basically says, uh, I didn't kill my dad. I'm going to bring it up here um, and probably going to have to play it twice because these are pretty quick. Um, but here we go. First piece of sound here. Uh, what or how bad everything was going to get or how bad everything had gotten for him. But I do know that I do not think that his justification and his out of whatever storm he concocted was to kill my mother and brother. And play that one more time. I was thinking that I don't know what or how bad everything was going to get or how bad everything had gotten for him. But I do know that I do not think that his justification and his out of whatever storm he concocted was to kill my mother and brother. Dr. Raj, you're the shrink. He doesn't think that uh, whatever storm, uh, he, you know, he concocted that killing the, the you know, the love of his life, uh, his wife and son was a way out, essentially saying he doesn't think he did it. Uh, how do you read that? Well, a part of when you get into the Murdoch's, you, you just can't get into a family. OK, that's where people, all, you know, in the family and will he survive that? Th this is a community. This is. Uh, a web in that area of where people were are blood related. And I loved, I don't know who said it, but uh, gaslighting is at the core of their existence. It was there before this happened. It's still there. And uh, let me tell you, where this happened is at the south part of the state. I live in the north part of the state. And people who knew the Murdoch's whisper it even up here. That's how influ influential it is and how influential they are and how influential the story is. So do I think Buster will rise above that? I want to say very clearly in South Carolina, that will never happen. He will never recover from this in South Carolina. His only chance is Canada, maybe. It's got to be somewhere where he's not connected to the family. They, they can't afford to tell a different tale than what you just heard right there. That That is uh, the truism of what the family feels like happened, that he did not intentionally, he didn't do it, you know, it, somebody else must be doing his covering. That's just all part of that gaslighting narrative down in South, uh, the South, South Carolina. Collier, could you have stayed in Mansfield, Ohio? Collier? I didn't. I, la I I went to music school and then I dropped out of music school and moved to California, moved and be to L.A. and became a filmmaker, got into yeah. the entertainment business. You uh, know what I mean? I could not. I mean, I look, I just want to be very clear. The community, I stayed in the community that this all happened and I grew up in it. And the over vast majority of this have always supported me and it gave me a lot of support. So it wasn't my decision to leave because of that. It was just I didn't want to be there and I didn't because of I didn't want to be reminded of these things. And, I, you know, and I and I love my community of Mansfield, Ohio, and I, I, I love how they rallied around me and still continue to do so. But, you know, he has to he has to remove himself and, you know, don't go to Canada. It's too cold up there. Come to I California. Just, I just use that. Our weather's much example. better. No, I know. But, you know, but you know, the go, neighborhood. And, and I think and I think the thing is, is that, you know, it, this will, you know, unfortunately, because this is so public. And again, with my father's trial happening in 1990 and not, you know, 2020, you know, tw the 2020s, nobody is going, you know, you know, I had a easier chance of getting out, right, and not walking down the street and being like, "Oh," until I, you know, obviously the film and the podcast. But I was, you know, uh, Forensic Files did an episode about this called um, uh, "Foundation of Lies," and so people had recognized me from that. But for the most part, I lived, I lived a pretty, you know, I, I when I got out, 
I lived a pretty obscure life. Like nobody really knew my story. They knew I was from Ohio. My dad killed my mom. I was adopted, et cetera. That was it. It wasn't until my film came out that I had people, even my, my peers in the entertainment industry coming out to me and saying, wait, this is your life? Like I have no, I've known you for years. You're a working cinematographer. Like how, you know, so I was able to sort of remove myself from that situation. Um, and it was very healthy but still acknowledge like I have a community there that supports me, but I need to go and live that life. And I honestly think if he wanted to do that, they would support that. They'd be like, you don't need to be here. You don't need to be involved in this. I mean, I don't know how far away he is he's in Hilton Head, I heard or something, but he, he can confidently move on and, and at least try not, to start Not to new. Hilton Head, he couldn't. No, no, yeah. no, but that's what I'm saying. I, I'm sure that's very oh, close. It's very, close. Very it's close. very close. Yeah. I'm saying getting himself out of that is, is also Beyond. very healthy. Is also very healthy, and I also agree way, with what uh, Kurt just said here in this comment. By the way, yeah. I, uh, by the sure. way, uh, Heather N says, "Got to get Roger a selfie stick." I agree wholeheartedly with that. We're gonna we're gonna buy him one. Um, we'll get him a little tripod. Uh, but yeah, Collier, I was gonna actually ask Sarah Ford about this. Buster feels from Kurt like he can't leave his dad because everyone else has deserted him. Sarah, you deal with victims all the time. Um, do you think that uh, there's an element of guilt where he doesn't feel? He can leave his father in prison alone and go to Canada or elsewhere. Gosh, I'm sure there is. I mean, I think that, you know, just emotions that, that victims deal with, you know, if he believed that his father committed these murders, the guilt that he's going to feel because he's the only one that's left. So, you know, him getting on Fox Nation saying, you know, I don't believe my father did, but also his his mother and, and brother are are dead and, and feeling guilt about that. I can't imagine the, the emotions that he deals with on a daily basis that he has to every day that he gets up, this is what he's faced with. I mean, just looking, I mean, at the comment section, I mean, even in this, you, even in this stream of, you know, Buster sucks this one, you know, I can't imagine that. Um, and so I, I can't, the, the guilt that he must feel the, the difficulties that he must face on a daily basis just to exist, just to survive one day is tremendous. Um, much like the, the phone that uh, Dr. Raj is, it's a survivor as well, you know, it's like being on a roller coaster. Yeah. I simply <laughs> am on with computer. I'm on this iPhone. Uh, well, Roger, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to get you a little tripod. Uh, Rachel Carter says, "I followed the Boyle murder and live in the next town over. I've watched Collier succeed over the years. Love from a town." Um, go Eagles. Let, yeah, let's get it. Go Eagles. Let's get, uh, so, uh, thank you, Sarah Rachel. Ford, uh, before we play another piece of sound, um, Buster Murdoch did use some in interesting language referring to it as a pre quote unquote predetermined trial. Um, he said, uh, I don't believe it was fair of his murder father's murder trial. He says I was there for six weeks studying it. And I think it was a tilted table from the beginning. And I think unfortunately a lot of the jurors, felt that way prior to when they had to deliberate. It was predetermined in their minds prior to when they ever heard any shred of evidence that was given in that room. Those are strong words. Let's play this piece of sound um, and uh, we'll get your reaction, Sarah, for we're going to have to play it twice. Might have to play it five more times. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> They have my phone on that interview. Well, that one uh, we're having an issue with. Let me bring this one up, Sarah Ford, and let's hope this. Here we go. It's like someone who can completely get away with lying and acting normal and carrying through as if nothing's happening. Does that describe your dad when you look at those definitions of that? I think there are characteristics where you look at the manipulation and the lies and the carrying out of that such. And I, I think that's a fair assessment. So he is said, I'm going to play that one more time, but he's essentially agreeing to the fact that his father is a, has psychopathic characteristics. I look up the definition of, of psychopath. It's like someone who can completely get away with lying and acting normal and carrying through as if nothing's happening. Does that describe your dad when you look at those definitions of that? I think there are characteristics where you look at the manipulation and the lies and the carrying out of that such, and I, I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, one of the things I uh, love, and I say this in jest about Fox, is that 
dramatic music they've got to be playing in the middle of that sound bite. Uh, Sarah Ford, uh, the the actual content of that is is um, is Buster is essentially agreeing to the fact that his father has psychopathic tendencies. Um, I don't know. Is it difficult to watch that in a way that he's got to kind of fess up to the fact that his dad's not all there? Heck yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember kind of being a, in college before I recognized you now, or maybe high school, I don't know that your parents are independent people and they have their own lives. And, you know, all of those things kind of coming to terms with that as you become an adult and realizing, you know, my parents, maybe they're not perfect people. Um, and I have two amazing parents. So, I mean, to, for him to be, be, dealing with this on a national stage in an interview, uh, it's very difficult to watch. I mean, I, I have great empathy for him, uh, not only as a victim, but just as a human being. I mean, it's incredibly um, difficult to watch. Um, but I, I do think for Buster, you know, living his life day to day, he's got to somehow move beyond being defined by the Murdoch murders and the Murdoch trial. Um, you know, we yes. talked earlier about, you know, what, what happens if, you know, they overturn this or they've got new evidence tomorrow at this press conference or yada, 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 whatever. Um, you know, I don't think that, that he can be defined by it. You know, Eric talked earlier about, you know, lawyers in South Carolina feeling betrayed by, the, you know, obviously a lot of these, these attorneys, you know, Alec, Corey Fleming, you know, folks that, that were, you know, highly respected in our legal community we can't, we cannot and are not defined by that. And I think that it's something that Buster um, has got to deal with. And I think, um, you know, if you are someone who, who does not have any empathy for Buster, um, that, that is, that's troubling to me because it's, you know, we've got a young man who's lost his mother, his brother, and essentially his father, and he's having to deal with it on the national stage. And, you know, he's got strangers talking about him on the internet. Um, and I think that's, it's it's a lot. I hope he can he can move behind that or move beyond that rather. And also, let's not forget, like Eric was mentioning earlier, and the rumors of him being involved yeah. in committing another murder. And when I saw him say that on the Fox News, and then and then obviously on the documentary on Fox Nation, I was really proud of him for saying that. I thought, wow, that's that's really because that's a lot. It's a lot to have come out of your mouth, especially in front of a camera. Yeah. I, I I was like, okay, you're you're at least trying to somehow harness this. And, and and manage this in a way that it, that seems positive, like you're you're slowly taking those steps, right? And um, and I loved when he also said, you know, have you do you know what it's like to ever be accused of murder? I thought he was his composure and everything that he the way that he handled the questions that were leveled towards him was really pretty pretty great. It seems like he and I don't know him from Adam, um, you know, I, I I feel like he is obviously a very intelligent young man and he is somehow in some way trying to process all of this as healthy as he can, you know, and, and I just, you know, I really hope that he can, that he can continue to do that and that he can, you know, not, not fall victim to anything that a lot of people do that face, you know, situations like these. And uh, Collier is one of the few people uh, looking at it uh, with a very similar lens. Kathleen Jameson here with a brave comment as a victim myself of one parent taking the life of another I think it takes a long time, as Collier just said, if ever to come to terms uh, with the truth. So uh, Kathleen could you know, watch this interview uh, in much the same way that Collier can. A couple more quick things. I want to play one more soundbite and then we'll wrap it all up. Uh, basically, um, Buster went on to say that law enforcement um, was unable to come up uh, with an other scapegoat that police rush, rushed to judgment uh, as we just heard that psychopath was a fair assessment. He said that he would never har harm uh, his wife, Maggie, or uh, his son and Buster's brother, uh, Paul. Um, and he said that, uh, you know, he was heartbroken after he testified. Here's another piece of sound where he's talking about um, that we didn't hear the whole truth. Uh, let's take a listen. That some of the things that are out there might not be exactly the truth. There's been an awful lot of, you know, negative publicity talking about, you know, my family and also about myself. And I just want to be able to give a truer perspective and let people understand that some of the things that are out there might not be exactly the truth. 
Dr. Raj, things might not be the truth as we know them. What do you make of that uh, little snippet? I I think that he's been uh, well directed, well informed, uh, and I want to say again: Do I believe he he has been severely wounded emotionally? Okay, I believe he he is continuing to be emotionally wounded. Do I think he will ever heal in this state? No, I do not. I think that that he's got to go to a place in which he can heal the wound. But when you have, he would have to go against a whole narrative uh, that is presented by the lawyers and presented by family members in the area uh, to admit that his dad is wrong and come to a place where he could be healed. I don't believe he can do that in this state. Uh, blonde girl, thank you for the super sticker. I'm going to get right back to you, Sarah Ford. Those upper class Southern families are defined by their family. Sarah Ford, go ahead. So I think he does make a really good point. I mean, as someone who's been a trial lawyer for, you know, going on 20 years now, everything, all of the facts, so to speak, are not coming out at trial. You know, what the jury hears is it's got to abide by the rules of evidence, you know, whether the judge is going to allow it in. So on, on some level, I, I, I understand what he's trying to say, perhaps. Um, but to, you know, every defendant who's in the Department of Corrections for 20 years, 30 years, life, whatever, is going to say, hey, it wasn't fair. I got a you know bad shake at it. I had a bad lawyer. I had this. There's an excuse for the reason why they're there. I mean, that's not exactly a novel idea here of, of blaming the prosecutor, blaming law enforcement, blaming whatever. I mean, I have never seen a perfect investigation ever. There's not ever going to be a perfect investigation. Uh, you know, could we could we pick out and say this this person is, you know, doing the best that they can as a as an investigator? You know, they did, a, a you know, 99 percent. We're always going to focus on that one percent and say they really screwed up here. And we should call them out on that. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. But that's why we look at the totality of everything. We've got 12 jurors to weigh this evidence and to weigh it. And if they, as they did in this trial, 12 jurors found him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, period. And we can, we can excuse that as much as we want, but, you know, that's just my perspective. That's the uh, justice Michael, system, good period. One. Yeah. Michael Couture, the whole panel is great, but Sarah is dropping gems. I'm Buster agnostic, but I appreciate the compassion and understanding for what he's gone through. Uh, Raj, back to this uh, second season. There wasn't uh, there was clamoring for more. There's going to be a second season of Murdoch Murders on Netflix. Um, yeah, of course, that is. starts September 20th, 2023. Giving these guys a free plug right now, but um, Raj, and you're uh. You go, Raj, you're, you're the uh, licensed therapist here. For those who don't know, Raj is in private practice. Dr. Roger Rhodes to me in South Carolina. He specializes in dysfunctional families. He's worked inside the prison system. Raj, your, uh, your final thoughts on all this tonight. Hold <laughs> our breath, hold our nose, wait for what's coming. I got to ask a follow-up. What's coming, Raj? <laughs> Oh, episode two, and and we're gonna they they're gonna beat the heck out of the one percent investigation. I loved hearing that. Yeah, the ninety nine they got right. There's one percent. Well, these guys are gonna beat that. They're gonna beat the one percent to death. Why? Because it gets it gets eyes. People listen. People watch, and it's a novelty and. People can't get enough yet. When they do, then it'll it'll go by the wayside. Hmm. Uh, Leah Baker, Leah Baker. I'm not sure which way to pronounce it. Buster being used, got to find his own voice. Uh, misdemeanor says Sarah, best guest lawyer. I think instead of layer, but lawyer. Um, Sarah Ford. For those who do not know, she served as legal director at the South Carolina. Uh, Victim Assistance Network since 2017, where she leads a team of attorneys and advocates to provide direct legal services to South Carolina crime victims. Uh, Sarah, what's your what's your podcast that you're working on these days and, and your final thoughts? Uh, Stepping Toward Justice. Uh, it's a it's a podcast where we focus on victim stories and hearing from people who work with victims and survivors uh, to put a little focus on 
um, on victims. So often we, you know, we're talking about Alec Murdoch again, uh, but we spend so little time focusing on victims. And that's really something that's important to me, something that's, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's my passion, it's my heart. Um, and so that's what we do. We took the summer off, but we'll be back again this fall with our season two. I guess I can say that. Podcast. <laughs> I'm in the podcasting. Next to the Murdoch team. Yeah. You know, I, I think that there's just so much here. I think the fascination, you've got this, you know, di family dynasty, this wealthy, well-respected family that has just had the ultimate fall from grace. And of course, people are interested in that. You know, and one thing that I they always want to focus on is making sure that we're focused on victims and that this is not entertainment. You know, if this is education, this is compassion, this is empathy, but this is not entertainment. Homicide is not entertainment. These are real people. Yeah. These are real uh, victims. You know, the tentacles of, of who a victim really is go so far. You know, I think about law enforcement who came upon that scene that night. Absolutely. They are forever victims in my book for what they saw, what they observed. Um, so I think just, just thinking about that from their perspective, I know we want to talk about, you know, the you know, what Dick and Jim are going to do tomorrow or what, you know, um, Alec Murdoch is doing. And, and it's, it's fascinating. It absolutely is. Um, but stay focused on victims and keep your heart open. And Sarah makes a great point. We have uh, chief Chris Anderson from the first 48 Birmingham, Birmingham. He's writing a, a book, man, you're crazy. It's called about um, mental health issues surrounding law enforcement. And I have detective Phil waters. He's investigated over 400 homicides as tough as they come a Marine a homicide detective. And uh, he tears up when he thinks of, uh, you know, a lot of the child murders he dealt with. And, and once you see a crime scene, like uh, those law enforcement officers uh, saw in this case or other cases, you can never unsee it. So I'm glad Sarah uh, brought that up. Uh, shout out to Autumn Blaze for that sweet comment. Uh, Collier Landry, I consider him a friend. We've never met in person. We're, we're about in three to weeks. We do. Yeah. Time. Yeah. I'm excited. Uh, he is the living embodiment of human resilience, hope, and personal triumph. He is a survivor, as you just heard, host of Moving Past Murder, as well as Survivor Squad. Uh, he's also the creator of A Murder in Mansfield, uh, the documentary from two-time Oscar-winning director Barbara Koppel. You've seen uh, Collier's work everywhere from Variety, New York Times, Esquire, USA Today. Uh, he's also a trained musician, a photographer, a uh, Evidently incredibly handsome by the uh, show of support um, <laughs> from SDS Nation. And uh, I'd kill for those blue eyes. Call your, your final uh, your final thoughts on all this. Well, thank you so much, Joel. The podcast is Moving Past Trauma. And you guys can find me here on YouTube at Call Your Landry on all my socials. Um, and I host Survivor Squad with the Survivor Squad with Tara Newell as well. But it, and to Sarah's point, you know, this is the thing is, you know, we need, you know, my friend Julie Murray said it best last weekend. We were at a podcast festival together and she obviously has been advocating for her sister, Maura, for years. And she she had this great T-shirt on and it had an E with like a Superman logo. And she talked about empathy. And the thing is, is that when you're looking at this and it is so quick to jump on the bandwagon to excoriate these people because they come from privilege or because they have this or because you think they're involved in things that they are either are or not but have never been convicted never been charged with and i think when you're looking at the at at, at victims and everyone here is a victim as, as sarah points out law enforcement the community as a whole the ancillary victims we have to it's very easy and very quick to get behind that that phone or behind that keyboard and write really nasty things but if you take a moment and maybe put yourself in the shoes of the victims of the survivors of the people who are dealing with the aftermath of all of this, you know, I, just do that. Just take a pause and just do that and try to engage with empathy and compassion as you would want someone else to do. No one asks to be involved in any of this, you know, and, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's something that I want to see everybody, at least in the true crime community and beyond engage with that empathy and understanding and say, what if I was in this situation, how would I want to be treated? and and move from there use that as a guide beautifully said uh andy school echoing call you're so happy to see the man you become despite it all you're truly a survivor uh, as my mom a holocaust survivor says we're all just trying to survive in a rough world uh that never ringing more true than tonight quick programming note 
Tomorrow, we're going to be live at 2.15 p.m. Eastern time for the 2.30 press conference. We've got some South Carolina attorneys coming on to break it all down for you. That is with Jim Griffin and Dick Harputley and looking for a new trial. Tomorrow night, I'm doing double duty, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Is there a serial killer in Chicago? Uh, we've got a preeminent uh, profiler. She works with Ann Burgess. She's been studying this. Uh, more than 16 or at least 16 bodies have washed up either in Lake Michigan or the Chicago River. And uh, is there something uh, amiss there? Is there a serial killer? Wednesday, double duty again, 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. We've got the U.S. Marshals and Scott Duffy coming on our show to talk about what's going on inside the hunt for Rachel Morin's killer. She is the mother of five who was uh, murdered on a hiking trail. Uh, that suspect's still at large. So what are they doing to try to track him down? Wednesday night, a lot of double duty this week. I'm going to need caffeine. <laughs> uh, We're doing Dan Markell. I don't know how I got talked into this uh, with state attorney uh, Dave Arenberg. And then Thursday night, the legend returns and Burgess on uh, BTK and all the latest uh, surrounding uh, that investigation. People think he could be involved. Investigators do in up to at least five more murders that we hadn't heard about. He confessed to 10 back in 2005 but thank you to a truly amazing panel kaya sarah dr roger rhodes and of course eric bland till next time love you america love you la love you mansfield ohio love you south carolina and the palmetto state and everywhere in between till next time